I, I shot the first episode myself when we went out right, we went out around town and we couldn't really we couldn't sell it. You know, we, uh, we were getting a lot of no's. So I was like, for me, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I don't understand how these people don't see this. So you know what? I'm gonna have to shoot some more episodes and and really show them the full vision. <laughs> Welcome to the Mayman Show. As usual, we are coming to you from our studios in Riyadh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And today's guest is coming to us from the City of Angels, Los Angeles, in the United States of America. We have a director, filmmaker, and rapper, Salvin Slick Naim. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. All right. And yeah, and, and I think this this episode should be a fun one. Give our audience uh, an idea of, of your eclectic uh, set of talents, and let's 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 delve into your filmmaking uh, endeavors. So you are the director and executive producer for the Netflix series Mo, and uh, this season has uh, you know you guys have been picked up for a second season now. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how you started this uh, this project, and you know, uh, and and just what it's like to reflect the series on Arab Americans. Well, um, the series was actually brought to me by Rami, by my friend Rami, and uh, he was you know co-created it with Mo, and it's the whole series you know is is, is based loosely based on Mo's real life, or Mo Amma's real life. So you know, Rami felt like me and Mo would be a good fit. And so as soon as uh, Mo and I, you know, got got together, our first meeting was a Zoom, and then we met in real, you know, in, in person. And we, I mean, we hit it off immediately. You know, it was a shorthand. It was like a quick, uh, quick, you know, quick chemistry off the bat. And, um, you know, that was it. After that, I went to Houston, where we actually shot, where he, you know, spent all this time over there and, you know, where the series takes place. And we just started uh, hitting the ground running, you know, going to all these locations and scouting and uh, riding around with Mo. And uh, it was an amazing time. And I think that, you know, it was important for this, so important because this show is so unique and singular that, you know, it's never been, th this this immigrant refugee story has never been told, you know, through the eyes of, 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 of Mo or through Houston. So we had a lot going for us and I'm glad that you know, the world has received it the way it has. All right. And, uh, you know, like, you know, for, for, for who, the people who don't know uh, about the dynamics of Houston's Arab American community, give us give us a, an idea of, of what makes Houston, Texas, an ideal location for, for the story. Well, you'd be surprised because, um, you know, to my surprise as well, when I got to Houston, it's actually one of the most diverse, you know, cities in America. And, um, you know, it's actually kind of like a, a central point um, to get to anywhere in the world, you know. So it's actually, you know, the airport over there is actually kind of like a George W. Bush International Airport. Yeah, been there a lot of times. It's <laughs> ironic that it's named after George W. Bush. You know, the most one of the most diverse cities. You know, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I think that um, it was a, it was a kind of a pleasant surprise for me, and even going there and the food, the culture, you know, the the the. The people, you know, everybody was was just, you know, welcoming and kind of open arms, you know, and it was a great place. And we'll, we'll be going back there for season two, and it's a two it's a two season uh, series, so we want, we wanted to tell it in two seasons. So this will be the end. This will be the last season right. of that. All right. And uh, did, did did was the whole purpose uh, when when you started the Netflix series to have it as as two seasons, or was it something that you guys just decided when you were picked up for the second season? Um, it was talked about early, and um, Mo felt like he could tell the story in two seasons. And, you know, he's on the road a lot, and because that has a lot going on for him, and I'm sure he'll be coming up with more stories as well as I will, and we'll be working together, you know, well past a second season. All right. And, uh, you know, aside from, you know, the... the Net, the the series Mo talking you know like basically reflecting you know points of views of, of Arab Americans and also utilizing talent from the U.S. You guys have an export comedy talent from Saudi in the series. You guys have uh, Maiden Nafei. Uh, so, what was it like working with him, and and how did you get into the project? Moyad Moyad is hilarious, man. Uh, he's a real great guy. Uh, we we became friends. He got into the project very simple. Mo knew him. Mo wanted him in the project. Mo pushed for him. 
Uh, you know, we didn't know who he was at the time, you know, in America. And uh, Mo really vouched for him. And uh, he pulled through, you know what I mean? You know, Mo was a man of his word. Moyad, we all had our suspicions because we didn't know what we were getting into. But when he came, I mean, you know, he killed it. He was so unique and, uh, and hilarious and authentic that it brought such, you know, such a tapestry to, uh, to the series. All right. And, and uh, what, what, what interaction have you had with him that, you know, solidified uh, Mo's recommendation? I mean, I, I, I actually agree with Mo. He's, he is, he's a one of a kind uh, comedian, I think, and he's doing some stellar work. But what, what, what made you get sold on, Mo, you know, Mo Eden the Fairy? Um, well, yeah, I'm trying to think the first scene I did with him, um, you know, he's, you know, the first thing I think, I, yeah, the first thing I did with him was when he's at the hookah spot. And he's like, she fool, she fool. And I mean, just, you know, he yeah. only had a few words. Yeah, you know? man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. She yeah, man. She yeah, fool, she fool. <laughs> so he only had a few words in that scene, but he was cracking us up. So I knew, you know, immediately, you know, and and what we noticed was after that scene, a lot of people in the in the uh, hookah shop kept saying, she fool, she fool. You know, so we were like, oh, this thing is catching yeah. on already in, on his first day. So we, you know, I was convinced on his, on his first day that he could, he could hold it down. All right, cool, cool. And uh, this, you know, this isn't your first Netflix uh, series. You know, you've you've worked with Netflix on uh, a previous project called it's uh, it's Bruno. Um, so how did you start this 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 project? You know, and um, basically, like, well, you know, what opened the conversations at that point in your career between you and Netflix to say, you know, hey, let me create content and move it to Netflix. Well, with it's Bruno, uh, Bruno is actually my dog, right, in real life. And when I was in Brooklyn, um, I got a little film crew together, a couple of my friends, a few of my friends, and uh, we just started shooting those those episodes already. I, I wrote them out, and uh, we started filming them, and then I edited them, edited them, and put them together, and uh, and then went out, you know, to 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 a bunch of networks with the episode. I, I shot the first episode myself, and we went out right, we went out around town, and we couldn't really and we couldn't sell it, you know, we, uh, we were getting a lot of no's. So I was like, for me, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I don't understand how these people don't see this. So you know what? I'm going to have to shoot some more episodes and, and really show them the full vision. So we went out and I wrote a couple more episodes and we shot three episodes ourselves. I edited them myself. And then I put together, you know, a, a document to show where the whole season would go. And then we went back out with that. And then that was a different story, right? Then we got a lot more interest in Netflix. Uh, Warner Brothers grabbed it and then brought it to Netflix. And then uh, they gave us the green light to do the whole series. So we, we so I reshot everything, you know, with a higher, with a little bigger budget, and a bigger crew, and uh, and that's how that mm -hmm. that came about. All right, and uh, okay. So aside from Mo and it's Bruno, you you have a lot, you know, other projects you're currently working on with with uh, Netflix. Uh, I uh, recall you're currently working on a modern day retake of of uh, Romeo and Juliet, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, that was in that was in the works, but um, that's we we don't know how long that's going to take or where that's going to go. The thing right. with the the thing with movies is, you know, movies they're one of the hardest things to get made, right? You could be working on a movie for yeah, five yeah. years and then find out it's not going to get made. Or you could be working on a movie for ten years, and and then or work work on a movie for a bunch of years, and then five years later, all of a sudden, somebody wants to make it. So it's like a very uh, slippery slope, you know, when it comes to the film business and getting movies made. Yeah, right? yeah, I know a lot of the the great the Hollywood greats, uh, you know, took years in the making, you know, not necessarily like a year or two. And, you know, as long as it's a slippery slope and not a scary slope, I guess. We're <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm pl plugging in my song right there, Scary Slope. Yeah, yeah, we're going to get into that in a bit, but I just had to say it. So you, you set me up for the line. So um, and uh, so you're from, you know, you're from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, you, you, you started out, you know, um, your career in filmmaking there. And, and I uh, also remember you're registered as, you know, as as a very budget oriented young filmmaker right if i'm not mistaken can you tell us a little bit about about that time and and just what started it all well yeah i mean on the topic of getting movies made i mean the one, the one way the only way to get it done on your time schedule is to do it yourself right so i had to raise the money myself through uh mom and pop shops in the area and kickstarter 
And at the time when I made my first feature film, which was called Full Circle, which is out on uh, Amazon and, and, and everywhere, um, I just went and did it myself, you know? And at the time, by r raising that money, um, I was able to uh, have the lowest budget feature uh, that was registered in the, with the mayor's office of New York Film and Television and the youngest, youngest mm -hmm. producer at the time. Uh, so, yeah. you know, it just shows that if, you, if you're hungry enough, you'll figure out a way to make the movie. So I made that movie for under $20,000. That's 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 very, you know, I'm not gonna say cheap. Let's just say cost effective, <laughs> for for making movies in in the U.S. Yeah, very economical. Uh, so like, yeah, very economical. So I I, I mean, how did you how did you end up managing to wrangle up the funding for for this? You know, like I'm sure that 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 that, that project in particular probably stands out the most for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it wasn't you know it was very difficult. Um, you know, I shot a bunch of scenes, same thing, kind of same formula that I did with Bruno. You know, I shot some scenes from the movie, put it together, put it like a little sizzle together, you know, and uh, showed people, um, showed everybody the vision of where it would go and how we would make it. And, and um, yeah, I mean, I just kind of laid it all out and then went around town, went around the neighborhood, going to the, to the local stores, telling them, the store owners, you know, hey, if you give me a hundred dollars, I'll make sure that one of our actors, you know, comes out of this store or we feature this store in the movie, you know, and then going online and using webs, using fundraising, you know, platforms uh, for people that I couldn't walk to, right? To try to get the, them to throw in $20, $50, $100 here and all that added up, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I mean, did, did you ever try doing a GoFundMe? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, that's essentially what it was, right? It was just like that. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, that's it's, it's it's always nice to see how you know hungry talent who want to get something done, you know, don't take no for an answer. So it's 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 I know in the U.S. in particular and in, in, Br in Brooklyn, it's pretty hard to get somebody to believe in uh, basically a project. You know, if, if especially if you don't have like the track record of results for them to invest in. You know what I mean? Yeah, or a big movie star, so something like that. You know. Yeah, you know, like, you know, like a big brand name that, uh, you know, like that, uh, that's already has, you know, like a hundred movies <laughs> made and, and, you know, people just want to fund. So like, d did you start out uh, filmmaking or were you, uh, you know, into the music industry first? No, I started off rapping. I started off as a rapper and um, I started writing yeah. songs, you know, and then being able to, when every time I would write a song, I was, I, I would envision, you know, the, the music video or how it would go. And, mm -hmm. um. All right. You know, these two, two students from NYU Film School, they were fans of my music, and they approached me and asked uh, and offered to do my first music video for free because they had all the equipment from the school. Right. So, of course, I took them up on that offer, and that was the first time that I actually got to kind of write the treatment and the visions of, of what I have for the song, and they were able to execute that. And that's the first time I was able to look at something that I had in my mind, you know, projected on a screen, and that's when I really caught the bug to to direct as well as rap. All right, and uh, so so how how many uh, tracks have you have you made so far? Oh man, I'm over a hundred, you know, at least. Yeah. All right. Okay, and and uh, let's let's talk about your 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 most recent release, Scary Slope. Which you, uh, you know, before we did this interview, I, you know, just recently released like a couple, like a week ago, I, I think, right? If I'm not mistaken. About a week ago. All right. T tell us a little bit about Scary Slope. Why did you decide to write it? I mean, I like the lyrics personally for someone who tries to balance two careers. So, you know, it, ring, it rings with, rings with, with what I do. But uh, what about you? Like, what, what, what made you want to write it? I mean, you know, to me, right, music is kind of the genesis of, you know, our state of mind, you know, and how we're feeling at the time. So for me, uh, as I become more successful as a director, it's always important to understand where it all started. And for me, it all started as, as a rapper and as a music artist. And, you know, I chased both of those dreams, right? I chased the dream of, of, uh, of a music artist, of a rapper and a songwriter and uh, a director and filmmaker and you know usually or sometimes people are just want one of those you know so it's so it's a lot clearer and it's a lot you know you know more poignant of a path but for me i want I, i'm chasing both and when you're chasing both of those 
you know, that becomes a bit scarier, right? So it becomes the scarier slope, like mm -hmm. a scary slope. So for me, you know, juggling both of those careers while being, you know, a father and a husband and, and, and dealing with your, your personal life as well, you know, it's not easy, it's, it's, it's not comfortable, right? But we can find mm -hmm. growth in, in discomfort and that's, that's, you know, and challenge, you know, in discomfort and that's what, what I like, right? It's challenging myself and kind of living life to, to its full potential, you know, and that's, that's, what, that's what Scary Slope's about. All right, and uh, you know, I, I, you, you were really good at at balancing time. You know, you were nice enough to do a quick uh, Zoom huddle with me a couple of days ago, and and you know, I was I was uh, asking you if you were on set, but it turned out you were actually having you know some quality time with your daughter. So I, I I really appreciate the fact that you took the time, you know, just to you know get on get on Zoom with me just to basically recap what we're going to do for this for this episode. So that just, you know, just shows what kind of uh, dedication you have and how you try to balance everything. And, uh, you know, speaking speaking of your family, uh, you know, you, you have, uh, you, uh, okay, you mentioned previously you direct your music videos. However, your latest videos are directed by uh, your wife, Rima, <laughs> uh, a friend from... A friend from school, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about about, about this uh, this evolution in, in uh, creativity between you know you and your your significant other, your wife? Well, I think it was you know perfect matrimony, right? Because she always wanted to be a direct a music video director, my wife, but she ended up you know she ended up talking about juggling both, right? She ended up becoming a doctor and uh, opening her own clinic and all that, so she had a lot of success there. Kind of like I had a lot of success as a director, but she always wanted to be a music video director. So me being a husband and a, and a music artist, you know, we were able to collaborate together and we were able to make that second passion that she had, you know, a reality. Because, you know, like I said, I got over 100 songs, so we got plenty of music videos to, to shoot and direct. And so she would come up with a lot mm -hmm. of ideas for, um, you know, my songs in Scary Slope, which we're, 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 when we're talking about right now, she directed she directed the music video to that. So she had a vision and we brought all the crew together and now she's able to live out her dream as well. All right. And uh, how many videos has she directed for you so far? Uh, I think she's directed like four or five, you know, many more okay. coming as well. All right. And then uh, I remember seeing one uh, that had like kind of like a futuristic Mad Max vibe kind of, if I'm not mistaken. What song was that? Yeah, that one's called In the Vault, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. so we're, like, in a car, like, like, driving, running away from these, like, crazy, uh, you know, psychopath killers that are trying to get some treasure from us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it must be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's, it's always nice to, you know, like, have a platform to release your creative expression. Um, so what made, you, what made you want to get into the music industry? You know, like, exactly, like, you know, like, when you made your, you know, you, when you wrote your first song and you performed, what, how, what made you say, I want to do this, I want to pursue it? Um, for me, it was just very organic. You know, I would listen to, to beats sometimes as a little kid, you know, it was like, I don't know, like 10, 11 years old, I would, I would be listening to beats and I would come up with, with melodies and, and lyrics in my head. So at, at a very early age, you know, I was already kind of tuning into that. So as I got older, as a teenager, I just started, you know, writing. I started writing songs and recording them in my in my mother's bedroom, you know, in my little bedroom. And, um, you know, yeah. that just kept evolving, you know, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. And then that, you know, evolved yeah. into listening to beats a lot. I would listen to um, score songs and just songs from movies that I like. And I would envision scenes, right, and actual and characters and actual visuals to that so i so so it was always hand in hand for me you know ever since since i was a kid yeah so which which uh artist inspired you the most growing up artist that inspired me the most growing up would have to be uh tupac jay-z nas biggie uh big l bone thugs nate dog um yeah th those guys were were heavy in my rotation as a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was a bit. I mean, I, I I liked all these artists. I was a huge Doc, Dr. Dre fan. I, I liked his his. Uh, I also like his story. I think it's pretty inspiring. 
for someone against all odds to yeah someone that big you know to make this brand with all you know against all odds and against everything that's what's been going on and and you know the rap music industry in the 90s um so you know you've 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 been to Saudi Arabia before you know uh previously and and uh, you've had a visit you know you and your wife and everything can you tell us about you know that trip and what it meant for you um that trip was you know illuminating and and educational and you know and was amazing right it was it was going to a place i've never gone before seeing a culture i've never seen before and um you know actually you know my wife has roots there so for me it was also seeing family right seeing my my mother-in-law and you know it was uh it was a great trip, you know, it was, you know, we were able to, uh, we went to the uh, edge of the world, that's what it's called. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we went to that, it was amazing. It's like this, like, talk about Mad Max, right? It's like this, like, desert cliff, you know, that was, that was incredible. Uh -huh. um, you know, we just, we, we, we were just able to soak it all in, get, eat some, eat some food, some delicious food over there. Some, some, some great fresh pomegranate juice, too. You guys got the best pomegranate juice out there. Um, yeah, I mean, for, yeah. And, and, you know, just being able to uh, kind of engulf myself in, in the culture as well. I have my thob and I have my, my uh, you know, my, 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 my Saudi culture was kind of infused in there as well. So I had a good time out there and I look forward to, to going back and, uh, and eventually performing there too. Yeah, uh, all right. I mean, uh, so like, you know, there, there's lots of... Uh, alluring stages uh, stages for uh, artists from around the world actually to perform in, in Saudi Arabia. So, what's your what's your thoughts when I tell you that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, holds the largest electric music gathering in the region? You know, Middle Beast, which which uh, has an influx of people coming into Saudi just to attend this festival. I'm not surprised, you know, I think, you know, with their new initiative, they're really bringing a lot of entertainment, you know, uh, to their to their city. And I feel like, you know, it's uh, when, when Saudi does it, they do it big, you know, they might, they're going to do it big. So mm -hmm. they're going to put a lot of resources into it. And I think it's it's been showing. Right. It's been, uh, you know, it's been a Indeed. huge hit and I look forward to collaborating with them. All right, and as someone who's seen the edge of the world, and uh, you know you're into filmmaking, which you know, what's your thought about the the movie industry initiatives happening in Saudi? So they recently uh, have filmed Kandahar here in in Al Ula, and you know there is the neon media sector. They're offering incentives and rebates to attract you know uh, studios from around the world to to come and film in Saudi. And there's current projects actually happening right now. I think it's a great idea. I mean, you look at places like Atlanta, you know, who, who that, that was a, a city that came up with a huge incentive, uh, you know, a tax incentive to give rebates back to all these, you know, movies. So they're getting a percentage of their budget back, which incentivizes them to go and film there. And that, you know, took off major for Atlanta. So I imagine it would be the same for Saudi. You know, I can see a, a lot of films and a lot of shows shooting out there as well for sure filming out there all right and uh you know while i have you here i have to ask you this uh you know have have you decided if you if you want to you know spit some verses on this interview yet or no <laughs> i mean you know what we, we could do anything you want to do man we, we can spit some verses anytime oh man thanks a lot appreciate it appreciate it. Yeah, yeah why not man i'm a big fan of music so you know if any time somebody wants to bust the rhymes or play something on my show I'm, i always welcome it so the floor is yours all right well look i'm out here stacking these bags but yet i'm away from the fam Got one foot out, another one in. It's hard to remain on the fence. But don't listen to people that doubt. They tell you there's no other route. But they have no idea. See, their opinions, they really don't count. Because, look, they're thinking it's facts. But see, the truth is they're really not sure. You look at the bank. Go look at the bank. I promise I tell you them figures it's fraud. I live by my word. I die by the sword. And if I swerve, it's going to be fraud. No matter the work, stay true to the cause. And I'm going to be there for whenever you call. You know? That's good, man. Was okay. So you, you just freestyled that, or did you write that? No, that's that's from a track I did called um, "It's Yours." That's that's I mean, that's pretty good. I mean, e even if I write things, I, I forget them. So you you just like 
right away. I mean, boom. <laughs> my hat, my hat's off to you, man. <laughs> they don't know what to do with the sauce. They don't make them like you anymore now. Who would have thought work nights till two in the morning? I told you I'd do it before, but they never did listen. Nah, I never got the message. But me, I take an L Y because they ain't a loss, my man. That's a hard earned lesson. You know. It's, it's, it's facts too, you know what I'm, what I'm talking. These are like, you know, how I feel in the moment as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I I think there's there there's a lot of stuff that uh, you know that can inspire you for 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 music. But what inspires you the most when you write your lyrics? What do you, you know, like if you had to give me something that goes through your mind, you know, before you write verses, well, how, how do you like to basically get yourself in the zone for that? The beat, you know, I listen to the beat. The beat kind of sets off. You know, what, what direction I'm going to go with it, lyrically and melodies and all that. I'll, I'll, the beat will inform where I go with it. All right. That's cool. And uh, before we wrap up our, our interview, uh, I always ask this to every one of my guests. Uh, what personal message do you have for the May Man Show and Arab News audience tuning in? My personal message is don't doubt yourself, right? Don't listen to people that doubt. They tell you there's no other route. You know, I, the, it's exactly what I what I spit. You know, what I rapped. It, 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 it's facts, right? It's like, for me, I was told that I could never make a movie. You know, for for twenty thousand dollars. So they, they said it, it could never happen, but I did that. You know, and that set me on a path to where I am now. Uh, so constantly, and I still even to this at this stage, even where I'm at right now, I will still get doubts and, you know, and. Um, you know, blocks. You know, it's fine to get doubts and it's good, you know. But you need that stuff and, you know, you need, sometimes you need rejection because rejection is just, you know, a, a, another baby step to success, right? So you need those steps and it always feels better when you get that, right? It's like, it's like when you, like, you know, I play basketball here and there and it's like the win, when you win a game, it feels way better after you lost a bunch of games, right? If you're just winning all every single game. Yeah. It feels good, but it's not the same after, you know, when you lost like three games and you win that fourth game, you feel way better than you did mm -hmm. than if you were winning the whole time, you know? So it's important to, and you're learning every time for, with those losses. So it's important to take your, 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 your losses and failures in stride, knowing that, you know, the lights, the lights at the end of the tunnel is there and you're going to make it there. So just keep going. Cool, cool. All right. And, uh, you know, before we wrap up and everything, I'm going to close the show uh, with with a, basically a quote that rhymes. I mean, I'm not a rapper, but at least, uh, you know, like what I'm going to say is, is going to be a little neat. So uh, tune in to the next Mayman show and to quote superstar Billy Graham, the man of the hour, the man with the power, too sweet to be sour. What you see is what you get and what you haven't seen is much better yet. See you later. Hey, okay, okay, okay. See you.